Good morning, everybody. Dr. Rick Wallace dropping in on you. I hope that everybody is having an unbelievable week. Uh, no matter where you're at right now, if you're still breathing, you're still in the fight. Remember that. I say that all the time because I truly believe it. I have lived my life on that particular principle. Uh, I don't quit as long as I've got breath in me. As long as I'm alive, I'm still in the fight. I don't care what the condition is. I don't care what the situation is. I don't care what the circumstances are. If I'm still breathing, I'm still in the fight. I'm getting up every morning with a positive mindset that today is my day, that I'm going to change things, that I'm going to overcome. And I have fought through many obstacles, many setbacks, many disappointments. I have overcome and withstood delay, disappointment, frustration, because I refuse to quit. Whatever you're going through, whatever you're seeing right now, is not the end. You are in this. And if you commit to going the distance, there is absolutely nothing that you cannot accomplish. It's about finishing. Uh, I tell people all the time, it's about finishing. It's the distance you're willing to go. Uh, yes, you need to be prepared. Yes, you need to have a good mindset. Yes, you need to have connections. Yes, you need to have a skill set. But at the end of the day, the psychology that says I can't quit has to be at the forefront. You know why? Because if there's any point in which you are mentally prepared to quit, you will be pushed to that point. That's how life works. When you make a demand on life, life will meet any demand that you give it, but life will have a counter demand. And the problem is most people balk at the counter demand that life makes on them. You know, I want to do X, Y, Z. I had a client once come to me. They wanted to work on their marriage. Um, and when I told him what he needed to do, um, he, he, he really wasn't feeling it, but he really, really wanted to work on his marriage. He really cared about his wife, but it was some things that he was uncomfortable doing. It was some things that he felt he shouldn't have to do. And I told him it was absolutely necessary. And initially he went and did it, but he did it with reluct re reluctance and resentment. And it made things worse. And he came back and I said, no, you got to change your mindset about it. You got to embrace this new change. You got to embrace and embody why you're doing it. It's got to mean something to you. You got to see the benefit of your sacrifice and, 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 and embrace it, not as some horrible thing you got to endure in order to get something, but some things that you're willing to do in order to have something greater. That's the problem. That's what I want to talk to you about uh, this morning. Um, First and foremost, uh, look in the description box. There's going to be some resources that are available to you. I encourage you to take advantage of these resources. Life is not promised. So while you're breathing, you need to be in the fight. You need to be actually doing something to change your life. You need to be doing something that's going to make your life better. I want to encourage you to take action. Don't wait another day. Stop procrastinating as if there's no end, as if life is promised. We waste so much of our time treating life with, with, with this casual nature. What I tell people all the time is something that I learned from uh, someone I consider a distant mentor, so to speak, is Les Brown, is that when you treat life casually, you become a casualty. When you sit up and you treat life uh, as if it doesn't require anything, that you don't have to truly be invested, that you don't have to put a great deal into it, you will become a casualty because life requires you to have your A game on. Life requires you to come ready to put in work. Life requires you to have something to bring to the table or life will drive you all different directions and you won't have any control on it and you'll feel frustrated and you'll feel powerless. But anyway, that that's that. So take advantage of the resources that are there. Uh, if you look, look, if you're looking to work with me on a one on one basis, I just shared uh, the email address in the chat, uh, email the support team. I'm going to be out of pocket for the weekend, but email the support team. They'll get back with you and tell you what you can do in order to work with me in a one on one. I have a couple of slots available. Um, my I work with people on long term uh, from anywhere from 12 weeks to 52 weeks um, and we get work done. But let's talk right now on something that you can take with you today. Um, 
here's some things. Um, I, at, at one point in time, not that long ago, I did, I, I counseled a lot of clergy, a lot of pastors. Uh, it was a great deal of my work at the time. It was something that I was committed to because I felt it was needed for, for a number of different reasons. Uh, so I actually committed to it and I had some pretty notable clients. And um, I had one that called me and, 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 one, and one of the questions that they asked me, they were almost ready to walk away from it all. And one of the questions they asked is, why is it that, you know, blacks in specific, they were, they were a black pastor. Um, why is it that blacks are the most prayed up? Blacks are the most churched. Blacks are the most spiritual. And yet it seems that blacks are suffering the most. You know, we pray constantly. And I said to him, and he didn't know how to take it, but I said to him, it's a lot of wasted prayers um, that, that are going out because people don't understand the dynamic of prayer. And they don't understand the function of their faith. And see, prayer without faith is, is, is void and prayer with a misunderstanding of what prayer. See, prayer is not the power dynamic of you executing. Prayer is the power dynamic of revelation. Prayer is where you get understanding. Prayer is where you become encouraged. Prayer is where you receive the revelation and the direction and the opening up. You have to execute the plan. See, that's what, what, what most people of faith, not just Christians, but most people of faith don't want to see. See, most, most people want to pray and have God do what they're capable of doing. I see it all the time. People are praying. People are praying uh, God bless me with whatever the car is. God bless me with a new home. God bless me with a new job. God bless me with. And the truth of the matter is, you know, what kills me, this is what kills me. People of faith think that they have this unique space in, 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 because of the uniqueness of their relationship with God, which they should, because you should have an understanding that you're, here's the problem. Faith doesn't require religion. And often the time, religion confuses the relationship. See, religion says, if I do this five times a day, then I'm blessed. If, if I say this, if I, say, I pray every morning, I pray every night. So I should be blessed. That's not relationship. That's religion. And religion is a pre, isn't a prerequisite for having faith in a relationship with God. So what happens is you're doing things because that's what you've always been told to do. And that's always how you've been taught to do it. And you don't understand a relationship. See, a relationship, especially a relationship that has a similarity or, and I'm talking specifically now about Christianity, has a specific relationship to something you're supposed to relate to, like father to child relationship, God the father, is the ultimate relationship and yet you are treating god like some distant far off entity that you don't know how to deal with why because you are dealing with them based off of ritual instead of relationship see we're talking about wasted prayers and this isn't even church this is an understand this is a spiritual truth that most people who are religious don't understand and wondering why you are having a problem let me explain something to you i want to get deeper off into it let me explain something to you See, you, 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 so many of you are praying to God first and foremost for things that you shouldn't be praying to God for, number one. Number two is you're approaching it from a, dip, from, a, from, from a problem understanding. I talk to people all the time, and when I'm talking to them about their prayer life, they get a little uneasy because I'm coming straight at you. I'm not pulling any punches. I, I, I want to I make something clear. I say, so how does your prayer life go in the morning? How does a, a, a moment of prayer with you and God go in the morning? Tell me. And they get to talking. I say, what do you pray for? What are you asking for? And they're telling me what they're praying and they ask for. And they're telling me, and I do this and I do this. And then I close out like this. And, and, and my question almost always is, wait a minute. So in all this talking to God, at what point did you stop and listen? 
at what point did you wait to receive an answer or a revelation that may have gave you an idea of focus books to so see the mind of God has the answers to all your problems and the answers are always speeding their way toward you before you ever ask for it. If you go to the book of Daniel chapter 10, you talk about Daniel having a dream. Daniel couldn't understand. So Daniel prayed about it. And it says that Daniel prayed and fasted. Now check this out. Daniel was the person that everybody went to to interpret their dreams. So Daniel is used to being able to have the answer and the interpretation rather quickly. But for some reason, Daniel prayed and it took three weeks, 21 days. And it said he prayed and he fasted for 21 days before that was a response. But I, I want you to focus on the response in Daniel 10. It says that when when the when, when the angel of light came, that it was so fierce and so forceful that it scared the men around Daniel and they all fled or they all fell down. They all got, got out the way. So it was just Daniel and the angel. And, 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 and most theologians believe we're talking about the messenger angel, Gabriel. Well, the, it, it, it's not who it was. It's what was said. The angel told Daniel, Daniel, dearly beloved man of God, from the moment that you set your heart to understand, your prayers were heard. From the moment that you set your heart to understand, you know, so because it took two, because it took three weeks, wasn't because that God wasn't in your presence. It wasn't because the mind of God hadn't already established the answer. It wasn't because everything you needed wasn't already in play. He said, but I was, I was withstood three weeks by the Prince of Persia. Now we're talking about spiritual conflicts and spiritual interruptions. So there's some people in your presence whose energy doesn't align with the energy you're trying to create to produce and manifest the things in your life that you desire to pr produce. So what's happening? There's an interruption of the line between you and God, the revelation you should be seeing that will tell you what to do, you're missing. So that's the first thing is that we have to understand that there is an automatic. But see, the thing is, a lot of us aren't listening. We're praying, we're talking, we're demanding, we're singing, we're begging, we're doing everything else but listening. How man, Most of my prayer meditation is me hearing from God. You don't get it. I, I, God, let me tell you something. If God is omniscient, meaning God knows everything past, present, and future, and all the what ifs on top of it, do he really need me to tell him what's happening? Now, there's nothing wrong with venting. It's nothing wrong with speaking. It's nothing wrong with making declarations. It says that you should declare a thing and it shall be established. That's not what I'm talking about. What I'm saying is, I should be looking for the answer. I should feel a comfort in the presence of God that is always present because God's always presence. God, God is always internally present. But what I'm talking about is when there's this natural communion going on, that's when I should feel most at ease. I should be most open and my energy level on a hurt scale should actually be rising, meaning that if someone actually tested my energy emission, when I'm in alignment and speaking with God, it should be somewhere around 600 to 750. The meaning that the higher my hurt scale gets, the more spiritually open I am to hearing from God. Because see, the hearing from God doesn't come audibly. Let me explain something to you. The hearing from God is communication between spirit and spirit. And the more open and the higher level and higher frequency and higher vibration you reach, the more God is able to communicate. You are missing a lot because you're not on a high enough vibration. You're functioning from fear. You're functioning from anxiety. You're functioning from envy. You're functioning from bitterness. You're functioning from jealousy. You own 200 hertz and lower. And God is functioning on 600 and 750. And you can't reach it. You can't hear you frustrated. You feel alone. You feel empty. And what's what happens? You get more anxious, more fearful, more frustrated, more angry. And it just creates a bitter cycle of not achieving things. And now you're demanding of God things you should be doing yourself. God bless me with a house. No, get up. 
do the work you need. If the house you want doesn't fall within alignment of the income you're making, you've got to become someone better. That's on you. Put in the work, study, learn a new skill, learn a new craft, create multiple streams of income, decide that you're going to grow something and be something better than what you are right now, and then rise up and become that. You don't get what you want, you get what you become. If you don't have it because you ain't become it yet, stop sitting up asking God for things you're supposed to be out creating and manifesting on your own based off the power and the ability, the gifts that you've given that you should be hammering on and building skills around so that you become uniquely powerful in this world, increasing your value in this world so that you can demand what you want and get it. If God was going to do everything, there was no need to create you. There's a purpose that you have in this world. And if God was going to do it all, there's no need for you. There's a reason that you are here. Stop asking for things you can do yourself. Start understanding the dynamic of prayer. Prayer isn't about a wish list. Most of the stuff on that list, you can go out and get on your own if you apply yourself. It says that your gifts will bring you before great men. It will open and make room for you. So the gift is an opportunity that's inherently implanted in you. And you have the responsibility of what? Building skills around the gift, honing the gift, developing the gift expanding the gift, be putting yourself in the best situation to be as valuable to this world as you can. Because if you become valuable to this world, especially in a way that the only way that the world can get something specifically that they need is to get it from you because no one does it like you, you write your check and you have the right to do so. Why? Because you're bringing value with a demand of what it is you're expecting in return, whether it be money, whether it be time, whether it be whatever it is, you have a right to demand something on something you're delivering value on. It's absolutely nothing, absolutely nothing wrong with that. There's nothing biblically wrong. There's nothing spiritually wrong with it. You have a right to sit up and say, I'm giving you something of value. And based on the value I'm giving you, I'm asking this in return. That's a fair exchange, but you've got to become it. Stop putting things on your wish list for God. God's not a genie. God has established a protocol and universal way of doing things, and you've got to operate in that what you sow you reap. And that's, see, most people use that. We've been trained to see everything so negatively. When we talk about sowing and reaping, 99% of the time, we're talking about something negative. We're talking about somebody done some, what you sow, you're going to reap. But that works on the positive side just as good. As a matter of fact, what a man sows, reaps was actually supposed to be a positive conversation. I am sowing something that I can expect something in return. There's a sowing of a seed that will produce a harvest, and that's how I get what I I want. If I want a house, I got to start sowing seeds that produce what I need to have the house. I've got to start sowing seeds and being X, Y, Z. I can't sit up and put a wish list up because I don't get what I want. I get what I become. A lot of you want things that you have not put in the time, energy, and effort to develop yourself into a person with the capacity to have it. And even when you fool around and play around with the numbers game and end up with it, if you didn't put in the work, if you didn't make yourself capable, you'll end up having a short lived experience with it. That's why 90% of the people who win the lottery go broke in a number of years because they didn't go through the process. They sowed a seed on what? If we use the, the parables that Jesus gave, they sowed the seeds on what? probably on stone uh, or, or shallow or, or, or shallow soil. So it sprouts up quick, but it can't take root. So it withers when the sun comes out, it withers and it dies. So you get, do you get what I'm saying? So you're sowing on things, but you're not sowing properly. You haven't found fertile ground. And let me tell you why a bunch of you can't find fertile ground and you're having short lived uh, victories or no victories at all. Let me tell you why. Adversity 
is the fertile soil through which the seeds of faith are planted, cultivated, and then manifested and harvested. Let me say it again. Adversity is the soil on which the seeds of faith are planted cultivated, watered, then manifested and harvested. You can't keep avoiding the storm thinking that you're going to get something of any true manifestation. I think Will Smith said it like this. God put everything worth having on the other side of fear. I think he put it on the other side of pain as well. Stop thinking you're going to live in your corner of comfort and achieve anything worth having if you don't sit down and you're going to have to manifest some things through adversity. See, you want the prize, but you don't want the process. Stop asking God for things you're supposed to be creating and manifesting yourself. Stop being lazy. Get up and put in the work. If you don't have the capacity to create what you're supposed to be creating, it's time for you to make a change. It's time for you to do something different. It's time for you to stand up and make a move. You don't get what you want. You get what you become. Now, Here's the final thing, and then I'm done for the morning. Stop asking God to deliver you from the giants he sent you to slay. Oh, that's a wasted prayer, too. It's just as wasted as asking God for things you're supposed to be doing and building on your own. I'm not saying you don't ask for guidance. That's revelation. That's what prayer is about. Prayer is about revelation. But then the but the power equation is about faith action. See, prayer is about revelation. Power is about the action of faith. Faith without works is dead. If you believe that God's doing it, there should be some action that produces some 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 type of manifestation in your life. But let's go back to what I just said, so we can get get done with this, and so you can move about your day. You can have a major, unbelievable, awesome weekend. Let me tell you something. Stop praying to God to deliver you from the giants. He sent you to slay. I've been saying that for years. It's a bunch of people that are sitting up praying, take me out of this. I've been through some things, but see, God will allow you to move into some things. There are some things in your life that you're just simply meant to go through, not just because of you, but because somebody's watching you and you're going to be the proof that it's possible to overcome it. There are some people that are coming from where you came from that are watching to see if life is finally going to take you out. And you're right in the middle of a storm right now. And your constant prayer is, God, take me out. No, God, bring me through it. I don't need you to take me out. Give me the strength to get through it. That's the, I mean, I'm talking about getting on a level where you hear from God. I'm telling you because I know it. This isn't something I'm making up. This isn't something somebody taught me in seminary. This is something I'm telling you I got from experience. There was a time I was going through a very difficult time in my life. And my prayer was, God, take me out. This is, this is before the horrible thing that happened in 2012. This is some time before that, years before that. But I was going through something. And I said, God, take me out. But I was in a place where I was willing to hear. So I wasn't whining and complaining. I was literally acting on faith on how I believed I had interpreted God's promises. And so I'm saying, take me out. And I'm laying there. It's two o'clock in the morning. Y'all better listen to me. This isn't religion. This is about relationship. This is when the rituals don't seem to stick. This is when all the things you've been taught to do don't fall in, when it ain't nobody but you, nobody but you and God. And I'm sitting there two o'clock in the morning and I'm like, you got to take me out this. You promise no weapon formed against me shall prosper. And then I, I, I heard not audibly. But see, because I'm at a place in my spirit where my vibrations are high, my frequency is high, I can literally connect with the spirit of God that's always on high vibration. And God responded, I will not take you out of it, but I will bring you through it. But see, I wasn't done. Why? Because religiously, I had been trained to make demands based on my own interpretation of how I saw the scripture. And so I go back and I quote some more scripture and I make demands. 
And then this is God's response that shut me down. And I've never asked God to take me out of another situation again in my life. God's response was, you're more concerned with your comfort. I'm more concerned with your character and I can't build character and comfort. I need you to go through this. I will not take you out, but I will bring you through it. And that's when I learned what my grandfather had taught me at 17. Son, you're gonna be either going in a storm, in a storm or coming out one. Your only responsibility when you find yourself in a storm is to make sure you come out a better man than when you went in. The, sh the storm is there to shape you. The storm is there to strengthen you. The storm is there to build a resolve and a resilience that makes you relentless. The storm is there to build the type of person that won't break no matter how much they bend. You need the storm. Stop asking God to deliver you from the giants that you were sent here to slay. Just some people need to see you overcome cancer. It's some people who need to see you overcome poverty. It's some people who need to see you overcome a failed marriage. It's some people who need to see you do some things that they think is impossible. Oh, I'm talking about doing some stuff. This ain't that pretty stuff. This is the stuff that I'm telling you. When you get this, that's absolutely nothing in the world that can stop you. I haven't done the things that I've done because I got all the answers. I just know who does. And so I'm never, that's the thing that people will say about you. You get people to a man, they'll probably go, even my wife will tell you that the one thing about me is I never get rattled. I'll have a moment where I'm down for a minute. I have a 90 second rule. It used to be a 24 hour rule. Then I realized if I can control it in 24 hours, I can reduce it. I have a 90 second rule. No matter what happens in my life, I got 90 seconds to be mad, 90 seconds to be upset, 90 seconds to be afraid, 90 seconds to be frustrated and all that. And then after 90 seconds, it's time to put in the work. It's time to put it down because none of that stuff has value. There's no value in worrying. There's no value in having a panic attack. There's no value in being upset and ticked off. There's no value in any of that. The value is going to come in the trust and the faith that I have that God has built me for this very moment. And that if I'm still breathing, I'm still in the fight. Last major thing I went through. Well, I guess some people will say five heart attacks last year was major, but I took it in stride, you know, to the point my wife thought I was kind of tripping. But no, I just if I'm still breathing, I'm still good. But the, the, the last real true major thing happened to me in 2012, worst year of my life. I mean, just 12 years of one thing after another. I'm like, what in the world? But the difference was I had went through that experience I just told you guys about. So I never said, God, you got to get me out of this. I can't take it. The pressure to that was a point where it was so heavy. I thought I was going to lose my life. So my, my, I lose my mind. That's how heavy it was. You ever been there before? You ever been to a point that it just seems like so many things are going wrong and you don't have the answer. and They're just all coming in at once and you feel like you're going to lose your mind. My prayer was real simple. Let me keep my mind. Don't let me die in this. Wake me up every morning, God, and I'm going to answer the bell because I'm built for this. That was the promise to God. If you wake me up every morning, I'm coming out. I don't I don't need everything else is going to organically take care of itself because I'm coming out. I'm not staying here. I'm not accepting this as my lot in life. I'm not accepting this as the final narrative of my life and my story. I'm coming out. Stop praying. Stop wasting prayers on things you're supposed to be doing for yourself. You, you, you want a new car. Do what it takes to create the revenue to have it. Want a new house. Do the things it takes. That you, Let me explain something to you. Why, why, why I, I, I'm saying that to you. You're talking about you want a new dream house. There are atheists out there who've done nothing illegal who have dream houses. There are atheists out there who don't believe in God, who have done nothing illegal and are kind to people who have unbelievably nice cars. That's not a spiritual reward. That's a reward of putting in work. You've been designed to put in work and you have a spiritual covering on top of it. 
You've got a natural born built in favor with the universe because God has designed you to succeed. And you can operate on the faith that moves the universe. But you don't need God to do that. God's already given you that. But you got to act on it. See, you don't want the promise. I mean, you don't want the process. You just want the prize. You don't want the process. You just want the promise. Oh, that's not how it works, though. I didn't even mean to be here this long, but I need you to understand. That everything you need, God planted it in you. Now he wants you to take your first step of faith. Now what? Faith is the substance of things, what? Not seen. I mean, substance of things hoped for and the evidence of things not seen. It's the substance of the things hoped for and the evidence of things not seen. See, faith isn't even required until you can't see it. If I can sit down and I can put it on paper and I can work it out in my head, that don't require faith. It just requires action. If I can sit down and I can put the numbers down and I can say, this is what I make now, but this is what I got to make in order to have this. This is what I'm going to have to increase. These are the ways that I can increase it. It doesn't require faith. It just requires me to get off my behind and do it. It may take some time. But I, I know that if I stick with it and I don't give up, my timeline might be off, but I'm going to come through with it. What requires faith is when I can't even see it. It's so big that it's beyond my comprehension. That it requires something supernatural in order to manifest. That's when it requires faith. The evidence of things not seen. Some of you may require faith in the sense that the house that you're looking at is so far beyond anything you've ever imagined, it doesn't seem real. Well, you need the faith just to know that it's possible, but you're still going to have to execute the faith. James says faith without works is dead. Matter of fact, James says, show me faith without works and I'll show you my faith by my works. The fact you'll know that I got faith by how much energy and effort I'm putting into it. You'll know I believe in myself by how much time and energy and money I invest in myself. You'll know that I believe in myself because you'll see me working on myself. That's faith. Hmm. That's faith. Oh, ah, so I, I ain't got nothing against being a part of, uh, 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 of, uh, of any religion. But you better be able to step outside of the ritual of religion and cultivate relationship with the almighty God because it's the one-on-one -on -one understanding. I'm telling you, I know a lot of men who are daddies and fathers that are unbelievable fathers that have unbelievable resources, but they're not my daddy. So I don't feel comfortable calling them up and saying, hey, I'm trying to start a new business. I'm going to need 2.5 million of all that money you got to do it because they're not my daddy. I don't have a relationship. I know who they are. I may be even a follower or subscriber to some of the stuff they do, but I don't have. But oh, now my daddy's got it. That's a whole different thing. That's a that's a relational thing now. I can say, okay, now I can know that I have it because it's already there. That's the thing you don't get. It's there. If you can see it in the future, it's already there. You just got to get to where you saw it at. You got to walk a path that leads you to where you saw it at. But some of you are getting distracted by fear that's placing you on a different path. That's why you never encounter what you saw. Fears put you on a different path. Angers put you on a different path. Unforgiveness has put you on a different path. Bitterness has put you on a different path. You're on all these paths being driven by low vibrational realities and emotions that you can't experience something on such a high frequency. And you're wondering why God ain't answering. God answered you a long time ago. You didn't want to hear it. He answered you a long time ago, but you were too busy complaining. He answered you a long time ago, but you were too busy telling him what he already knew. It's time to change. I'm going to get off of here. 
and I've got an actual interview I've got to do. Uh, so I need to get off and sort of wind down because right now I'm on 10 because I'm telling you, I'm so close to that 600 right now. If you haven't been there, you can't understand what I'm talking about. It's not the emotion you feel on a Sunday morning. Now, it's that emotion you feel when you wake up in the morning and you know God's on your side. It's the emotion you feel when you go to bed at night and know that you might not have made it through the day if it wasn't for God. It's that emotion you feel when the doctor said you've had five heart attacks and we don't know how you're still here to the last two were major, but you're still breathing. See, that's what I'm talking about. So I'm going to get off here, but I'm going to tell you something. I live every day on full. You've heard me say this almost at the end of every inspirational or motivational or spiritual video. You hear me say, I live life on full so that when I leave this place, I die on E. And people are saying, what do you mean? It's, look, when you live on full, it means you give everything of yourself to that day. You don't leave anything that 86,400 seconds in a day. You're going to spend a significant part of that sleeping at night. So that's gone. But it's it, it, if you're sleeping and you're in a positive state and you rejuvenating and, and re-energizing yourself, that's well spent time. So don't don't be tripping because you slept six or seven hours. You needed that. Now you're up. How are you, you using? And I don't mean the rest of that time that you're up needs to be spent at your job, at your desk, working all the time. No, you need some time to, to spend with family. Some of that needs to be invested in your wife or your husband. Some of it needs to be invested in your children. But a lot of it needs to be vested in that business or that career or that job that you have that's going to take you to the level that you keep saying you want to be at. You're not going to wish yourself there. You're going to have to work yourself there. But you've got to make sure that you're not leaving seconds untapped. You got to believe that you You got to know that you're putting something in. It was someone that I hold very dear, someone that taught me so much. Dr. Miles Monroe, he said that the cemetery is the wealthiest place on the planet. Mm. Man, was he right. He says books not written. I mean, people died. They had books in them, but they never followed. Businesses not started. Institutions and schools not built. Relationships uncultivated just lived life existing. Didn't tap into their full potential, took a lot of it to the grave with them, never to be spent and used because it was just theirs. It was given to them and nobody else could do it. I refuse to be that person. Uh, the first half of my life was about me getting stuff and proving to myself I could have it. And I went, I mean, I did it. Second half of my life is about building a legacy that's so powerful that it speaks of me after I'm gone. That's my challenge to you. Like I said, look in the description box of wherever you're watching this video. There are going to be some links there. If you want to work one on one with me, I have a couple of spots available. If you really truly not, this is if you're really truly serious about making changes and you're willing to invest a minimum of 12 weeks up to 52 weeks to change in your life. Email uh, the email address that I just shared in the chat. And I'm going to go back and put it in the description box on a couple of these platforms. Uh, but definitely if look at some of the other resources that are there. There's something there that can help you start the process of changing your life. You've got to get out of the root you in. You're not going to win in that corner of comfort. You'll coast through life, never really having any major, major, major disheavals, but still experiencing some ups and downs and lows, but never truly living up to your full potential. Here's the thing. If you truly believe that there's a God, that's going to be a day of reckoning. I'm not talking about heaven and hell and all that. I'm talking about a time that you got to stand before God and you got to give an account of what you did with what he gave you. I do believe that. I do believe that you're going to have to stand before the almighty and say, you gave me this and this is what I did with it and be willing to give an account of why it is what it is. I just want to be able to stand there and say, I came, I saw, I conquered. I gave it everything I have. I took the bumps with the bruises, but you know what? I didn't retreat and I didn't surrender. I dare you to live a life like that. 
There's no feeling like knowing you won't back down. On that note, I'm getting out of here. You guys have an unbelievable day. Share this video with other people. Encourage other people. I would love to see some of you uh, signing up to work with me. Uh, that would be great. I love working with people. I, it, you know, I see a couple of my clients that were on here. Uh, I'm not gonna call their names. A couple of them are, are readily admitted in a minute. Uh, they're always on here encouraging people to, to to become a part of what I do. But I see a couple that are on here, and they may be some on some some uh, platforms that can't actually join the chat because not everybody has the ability to chat. But uh, I see a couple of them on here, man. They they'll tell you this is my passion working with people and taking them from one place to the next is the thing i live for to watch people do things that they never thought were possible or knew they could do but didn't have a clue of how to get there oh that's my thing but anyway look i'm gonna live my life on full so that i die on need. my challenge is you do the same on that note i'm getting out of here getting ready for this interview you guys have an unbelievable day